Um, last week, Brian talked to us briefly about passing the baton of testifying the good news of God's grace. The, um, the title of my message today is Take the Baton. I don't want you guys to miss it. Paul finished his race, and he handed that baton to his disciples. I'm going to take Brian's baton from last week and just run with it a little bit. So the testimony that I talked to Brian with about last month was um, my serving at First Coast Women's Services. Um, many of you guys know about that already. First Coast Women's Services is a ministry um, that provides support for women who have unexpectedly gotten pregnant and might be considering having an abortion. Um, I know that a lot of us have heard Cheryl Gonzalez speak before, um, and she's so thankful for our prayers and our financial support, and I am too. Um, anyway, this is just how I got started in the ministry. About 11 years ago, Jackson and I went through this little season, it was big for us, of being empty nesters. Um, and during that same year, Jackson's mom passed away and my dad passed away. And it was really just a season of dryness and aching and just being before the Lord and just sort of pondering, like, God, make our lives make a difference. Um, about that time, I began studying the book of Isaiah. Mary was with me at that time. And I kept seeing over and over the Lord's heart for justice in the book of Isaiah. Kevin, that's for you. This is where my start was. There you go. Kevin goes, has said to me before, is that the only book you ever read, Isaiah? And I'm like, well, it's a really, really good book. And it was really at Jeff's urging, not with me, but one time just flippantly he said, and Isaiah is the most quoted book in the New Testament, we really should do a Bible study on it. So I don't think Maranatha did a Bible study, but I began to dig into it. But these are some of the words, words like seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. And over and over, he doesn't just say it once in the book of Isaiah. It keeps bouncing into those words. And at the same time, my kids had been involved in the prayer movement um, in various houses of prayer, and they were praying against the in injustice of abortion. So that provoked me as well. And so during that time, the Lord began to impress on me, and my kids began to impress on me probably worried I didn't have anything to do, that I should put some hands and feet to those prayers and get trained at First Coast Women's Services. Um, well, I didn't just jump in and say yes. I struggled. I argued with God. I'm just going to go there with you. I would say things to him, but God, I like being at home. I'm really an introvert, God. I don't know if I have anything to offer these people, God. I don't really have the gift of evangelism, God. I'm, I just like being at my kitchen table, meeting with you every day, God. That's what's most comfortable. And at the same time, within maybe two months, I bumped into Cheryl Gonzalez randomly, and she came to me, and who's a dear friend of mine, and she said, you know, the Lord has, has had you on my heart lately. I really think you should be volunteering at First Coast Women's Services. Well, at that point, I was like, I can't escape this anymore. I'm getting it from the Bible. I'm getting it from, the God, from God. I'm getting it from my kids. And now the director of the Clay County Center is pinpointing me. You really need to do this. So I stepped out and said yes. Training was very extensive. It took several weeks. It was extremely thorough. For me, it took a lot of brain power. They, they really emphasize balance in the way they communicate with people. It's not just a, oh, yeah, come in and let's, let's do this. There was a lot of very specific training, um, things that were in place that made the clients feel like they weren't trapped or coer coerced in any way. There was no manipulation. There's no graphic pictures that 
um, made them feel traumatized about what they were thinking about doing. Um, there was even a, 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 what's the word? Not a ruling, but a suggestion in place that you never put the client, uh, you never sit between the client and the door so that they can't get up and run out if they need to. And so there were just all these little technicalities that, you know, in addition to sharing and sharing my faith and um, doing those things that we had to keep in place, which were amazingly good, no doubt. Um, the ministry is really run with a lot of integrity so, th so that they're above reproach in the way they minister. And it's primarily focused on loving these people, coming alongside them and sharing the gospel. That's really emphasized, is sharing the gospel. I had a lot to memorize. I had never shared the gospel with anyone before. I really sort of think, thought that I didn't have the bandwidth to comprehend it all. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. When a client would come in, I had to do an intake sheet, which meant I had to find out about possible pregnancy. I'm not going to go into great detail. Ask about medical issues. Ask about their drug history. Um, ask about smoking information, whether they're smokers or not. Ask about potential abuse situations. Then I needed to find out where they were with the Lord and um, share the gospel and administer the pregnancy test and wait three minutes for it to, to um, show us whether it was positive or negative. And if necessary, encourage them to keep the baby. And that was all in the span of one hour. I had one hour to do all those things. So it was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know if I can do one of these things. I was just having a lot of angst about it. But the training that, they, that you go through is very reassuring. I don't want to traumatize anyone that's thinking about doing this because it's, it's really an amazing ministry. And um, so the night before I had my first solo client, I had this very vivid dream um, where I was in a counseling room with a client. I was at one end of the building from my two directors that were back at, in the office. It was, a, you know, a, a, a house. So, but, but still, for them to hear me, I would have to, I really have to yell. So... In that dream, I was sharing the gospel, but I was doing it loud enough for the directors to hear me at the other end of the building. Like it was like, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? You know, and just like really hammering it home. I don't even remember the client, but I just, I, I was sharing all these things and I woke up and I was like, oh my goodness, what was that? Like literally, God, what was that dream all about? That was traumatic. It was, uh, you know, I'm going in today. What were you doing there? And I felt in that moment, the Lord say, I've got you covered. You don't have to worry about talking her out of pregnancy and sharing the gospel at the same time. And actually, the Lord told me, he goes, she's not going to be pregnant. You just need to love on her. You need to share the gospel. And you need to just show her the grace of the Lord in this situation. And lo and behold, when I went in the next day, that's exactly what happened. It was crazy. That was my very first step at sharing my faith with someone at First Coast Women's Services. It was unnerving. It was a little awkward. It stretched me way out of my comfort zone. But each time I got to share in that little room, it got easier and easier. And it actually began to be fun because you'd go in and just realize, wow, the Holy Spirit is going to do something new today that he didn't do last week. It was just like, look how he opened the door there. Um, I like, and it's so life-giving when you see someone's eyes light up when you're sharing with them and they have that revelation of God in their life. Like, it's, it's this open door for you. I like to think of sharing the gospel like, sort of like when you're diving into it, like developing a new muscle. When you first try to use it, it's not there at all. You're like, what? I... I don't have leg muscles to do this, but that muscle is there. 
So the first time you try a new sport or a new dance or any type of new movement, it can be completely awkward. But as you begin to take steps, it comes to you. And the more you do it, your muscles begin to memorize the steps that you take. And it becomes easier and easier. And I think that's what sharing your faith is like. It's that first step of I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone. I'm opening my mouth. This may be ri ridiculously awkward, but it becomes easier and easier as you step into it. Last week, Brian reminded us that the Apostle Paul likened the Christian walk to a relay race. We're called not only to be disciples, but to make disciples. Each of us needs to grab that baton of God's grace and pass it on to another. To win that race, which is to lead our children to Christ, to influence future generations, to minister to people in the workplace. My husband does that so well in his office with praying for his patients and and the spirit of counsel, and it's just, it's wherever the Lord is using you. I'm sure that any one of you, even the ones that not in ministry, the Lord directs you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you in the workplace. Um, and just as a side note, when I had small children, what I had to remember about all of this was my first disciples that I'm making are my children. If I if I don't get this right, it's going to be hard to move out into another area and be ministering for Christ. So they were the most important. And now my children are doing it with their children, which is just such a gift from God. Um, Paul continued to encourage his disciples with these words regarding the race. If you have heard me teach these things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses, now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. That's from 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And from 1 Corinthians 9.26 and 27, so I run with purpose in every step. I'm not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. Um, many of you have been watching the Olympics. I just came, oh yeah, you guys watch it? Yeah. Did you see the men's relay race? Did you guys watch that? Okay, I just found out that in the men's, re you watched it, Luke? Good job. Okay, in the men's relay, apparently uh, they've lost the race for years because of not being able to properly pass the baton to the next person that was coming up along. And this year, for the first time in I don't know how many years, they, won, they didn't drop the baton, they didn't have a failed pass off, but they, they won it for the 400, they won the gold medal for the 400 relay, which is amazing. It's just a perfect example of them needing to work on passing the baton. They needed to work those muscles. They needed to develop technique. They needed to keep running swiftly as the next person got passed off, which is what we need to do as believers. I can't go in blindly and share my faith with someone if I'm not continuing the race myself. I have to keep running too. So very important. We need to learn to pass that baton of testifying our faith, the good news of God's grace, and we need to keep running in order to pass it to that next generation. This is a verse that helps me from Galatians 1.11. Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on my own human reasoning. I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. These are Paul's words. The, Paul, the amazing evangelist who was trained by an amazing rabbi, Gamaliel, he knew how to argue the scriptures. He was trained in apologetics, and, and he had everything memorized. But what does he tell us? 
It's not by the words we say. It's not by the verses that we pull out and memorize. It's by revelation of Jesus Christ. And we need to remember that when we're sharing with people. You can go in and not have a particular scripture for someone, but just ask the Lord, God, would you, would you place that spirit of revelation, understanding on their heart so that they can really understand what I'm saying or understand how much you, you love them? This isn't just a New Testament mandate. It's one of the first commands from God in, um, or the early commands from God in the book of Deuteronomy where he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. So that mandate has been to us through, throughout the generations. The Lord wants us to keep teaching that younger generation, keep teaching the people that are around us. He wants us to pass off that baton. I love that Brian last week said that we're all called to share the love of Jesus, all of us. You might be sitting there thinking, I don't have the spirit of evangelism. I don't have the spirit of encouragement. I'm not really prophetic. I really don't do this. But what God says is, it doesn't matter. I've equipped you. And the people that I put in your path, I'm going to give you words to minister to them. I've equipped you. So you, I mean, sometimes I'm just like, God, I know I should do this. I really, I don't have time. I, I don't really feel like it, whatever. But the Lord considers you his worthy vessel. He puts you in that spot. He didn't put anyone else. You're the one. And so God is saying, you need to open your mouth. Um, it might not be with specifically sharing the gospel. I just think about sweet Betty McCarthy and all of the things that she did in her community. She would take people meals and bring cookies to people that she had just seen, and she loved on them in different ways. It might be um, through a listening ear to that person, just pausing and saying, I just am going to stop what I'm doing right now and listen to what, what's going on in your life. It might be interest in their life. It might be encouragement to their heart. It might be sharing with them the revelation from the word that God gave you that morning or a song God's been sharing with you. Um, it might be through sharing the love of Jesus. It might be through an invitation to receive Jesus as, as, your, as their Lord and Savior. Don't forget that that's what changed your life. You have something inside you that has healed you or set you free. You have things inside you that you can share with them. It's what changed your life. It's what's moving you into wholeness. It's the power of his resurrection in your life. Don't hold back. The Holy Spirit equips you. This was from that Acts 3.6, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. I kept hearing those words, I'll give you what I have. I'll give you what I have. Brian said the same thing last week. There are things in you that you don't know what's in there, but you've got, you've got a skill set. You've got... You've got the Holy Spirit. You have some spiritual giftings, and the Lord can use you. Peter gave what he had. He didn't have money, which was what the guy was asking for. It wasn't what the man was expecting. It was better. Do you hear that? It was better. It was better than money. You might have something better than what that person is asking for. It was the Holy Spirit that gifted Peter with that thing, with, with healing, Everyone has the ability to hear from the Holy Spirit and present the gospel using the giftings that God has given them. Don't worry. They're there. You do have them. 
He wants you to take that baton of testifying God's grace to continue the race. This is what the Lord says in 2 Corinthians. This is one of my, I don't know, just, I have several favorite verses, so, but this is one of my favorites. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of the human heart. Such confidence is this, that we have through Christ before God, Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It's not from us, it's from the Lord. And it's taking what Jesus gives us and using it. We're, we are the letter. We're the, we're the ones that are the written letters to the world. People see that in us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.9, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God. Paul actually went through tons of hardship and, um, and he wrote that in the wake of going through tons of hardship. He was like, I can't figure this out myself, but I'm learning that I'm trusting fully on the Lord. And if you, if you track Paul through his writings, you'll see that Paul learned, learned as he went on that, that, that Galatians 1.11 verse, it's, it's, not, it's not by my words, it's through revelation of the Holy Spirit, it, um, It's what God does that. We can see this um, reliance on God throughout the story of Joseph. And I'm just, the story of Joseph is so amazing. I'm going to try to paraphrase it a little bit. But remember Joseph in the book of Genesis. He was the favored son of his father, Jacob. His older brothers were, because he was the favored son, they were extremely jealous of him. And they didn't appreciate the somewhat haughty dreams that Joseph had about them bowing to him. You're going to come to me and bow to me. Imagine your little brother saying that to you. And you're like, wait a minute. I've been, I'm way older and I've been working in the fields way longer than you have. So they got so angry at him, they threw him into a cistern. And then a little bit later, like the next day, they felt guilty and they sold him to... Midianite traders that were traveling to Egypt. Joseph was about 17 at the time. And when he got there, he was purchased by Pharaoh's, one of Pharaoh's high officials, Potiphar. And he began to work for Potiphar, and Potiphar liked him so much that he put him in charge of his entire household. Well, a little bit later, um, Potiphar's wife accused him of some indiscretions, and so Joseph was just quickly thrown into prison. Talk about hardship that Brian was mentioning this morning. Here's, here's, a, here's a lot of hardships that this guy had to walk through. But the entire time he walked through, him, through them, God gave him favor over and over. When he, when he reached prison, um, he was put in charge of caring for the prisoners, and he did it really well. He did what everything that he did was spirit of excellence. He did it really well. And he never um, fought with God. He always had this sense of, I have faith in the Lord. He gives me dreams about me. I have understanding of God. And so that was sort of core to who Joseph was. So while he was in prison, um, two of Pharaoh's key people, the cupbearer and the baker, Pharaoh got mad at them, and he threw them into prison. So they were there for quite a while, and after they were there, they had some dreams, and Joseph went to them and said, why are you so troubled? And um, they said, oh, we both had these terrible dreams. We don't know what they meant. And Joseph said, well, let me interpret them for you. 
But he didn't take the credit for himself. He said, interpreting dreams is God's business. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. So they told him his dreams, and within a couple days, they were released from prison. The baker was killed, but the cupbearer continued to live. But they forgot about Joseph. He was left there. Even Joseph said, remember me when you go to Pharaoh and put in a good word for me. But that wasn't done. So there was Joseph in prison for another two years. Two years later, Pharaoh had some very troubling dreams. And no, none of the magicians or sorcerers, anyone could, could uh, translate them. So the, suddenly the cupbearer remembered, oh, I had, there was this guy in prison that's really good at at um, discerning and interpreting dreams. Let me bring him. So he brought him to Pharaoh, and Joseph, again, interprets the dream. But before he does this, he says to Pharaoh, it is beyond my power to do this, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. When he accurately interpreted the dreams and gave Pharaoh advice about the future, Pharaoh said, Can we, this is so amazing that this is in the Bible. This is an unbelieving person. This is Pharaoh, who at that time, they considered Pharaoh a god. He worshipped all these other gods. He thinks he's the highest in the land. But he says about Joseph, can anyone else find like this man, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Since God has revealed the meaning of dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or as wise as you. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing that somebody that considered himself to be a god recognizes the spirit of God in a man that just came out of prison. Look at Joseph. Let's look at him. He had no homeland that he was in, no family, no money, no status, No sharing the gospel training. Nothing in the physical realm to offer those in Egypt. And he knew that. But he did have the Lord. He had the Lord. And he had the spirit of the living God residing within him. And he had faith in God throughout the 20 years that he was in Egypt, serving Pharaoh's court. And he had the, the, the gift of dream interpretation. And he used that gift to lift up, to exemplify God, and to bless and to save the surrounding nations. And ultimately to fulfill the promise to Jacob that God will bless all nations through you. We all have hardships like Joseph. Joseph went through a, a whole string of them. But the Lord calls us to offer our lives just right where we're at. The Lord definitely knew how insecure I was when when I started serving First Coast Women's Services, but that's right where he wanted me. He wanted me to see that it was him doing that and not me. The Lord will open the doors for you. This is something that I constantly hang on, which is so amazing. It's his timing. It's his divine appointment. If he puts you in that place, he's going to give you the words. But you need to open your mouth. It's a both and. Like, if we want to be God's vessels, we need to be be willing to take that step. We need to take that step of faith and open our mouth. And and really, to be honest, sometimes I don't know what I'm going to say in those situations. But I just begin talking and loving and asking about their lives and um, finding out different, I ask about family, just different things. And then the Lord just will begin to speak to me about that. God will make things fall into place for you. God will even position you in places that he wants you to minister to people. And 
Jackie is such an amazing example of that. Don't roll your eyes at me, Jackie. <laughs> she truly has the spirit of evangelism on her, and she will readily minister to somebody in Publix or at the doctor's office or wherever. She, and she has such a burden to lead others to Christ. It's amazing. So um, God, remember with Joseph, he was divinely placed in all of those places. For God to use. They, they seemed like not the right places, but the Lord kept using him. I, a similar situation with me is um, Jackson used to, for years, did medical ministry in Cameroon, and I've been with him several times, and I, I am not medical, although some people think I am. Uh, <laughs> I don't have that training, just lived with my husband for a long time. But um, so I didn't have any medical ministry to go in and offer, not that he only takes medical people on the trips with him. And so when I got there, I was like, well, what am I going to do besides be Jackson's wife in this situation? Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord positioned me in places to do prayer ministry with people. So, so I just took what I had, loving people and being able to pray, and the Lord placed me in those situations. And a lot of people came for prayer. It was such, a, such an amazing blessing. I had this really interesting situation at First Coast Women's Services happen to me one time. A very, very energetic woman came in. Um, she was not a believer. She, um, but I asked her, I always would ask people, so do you believe in God? I wanted to find out where they were at. Were you raised in church? Um, what do you know? And then if they would say no, I would say, well, what do you know about the Lord? And um, just begin sort of priming the pump a little bit. And she was very enthusiastic, and she, sa she kept saying, oh, I went to this youth group once, and the youth pastor kept talking about James 4, 6. And she, she said, it was so amazing. I loved hearing about James 4, 6. And we were all talking about James 4, 6. And he said James 4, 6. She probably said James 4, 6 within the context of three minutes. And I was sitting there thinking, I don't know what James 4, 6 is. Like, God, you need to help me right now. And so I, I said to her, oh, would you remember what that verse says? And she said, no, I don't. And she, I said, I had my Bible right there. And I said, well, let's look it up. Let's see, let's see what it says. I want to know what was so exciting to you. And just a little back history on me and my Bible. Um, I have this habit of every time somebody gives a testimony or sometimes a message that's really meaningful to me, um, I have Jeff's written. Uh, sometimes it's a Jeff's name. I have Brian's name. I have... Sometimes it's a prayer for my children. I'll put my children's names. But oftentimes it's, it would be a testimony. And so years ago, I was at Ballet Magnificat. Martina was there. And a friend of hers was giving a testimony. And it was really amazing. And I jotted her name right there. And to be honest, it's a name that can be written about seven different ways. And when I opened my Bible that day to that young girl who came in that talked about James 4, 6, her name was written right next to that verse. And, and in that spelling, in that particular spelling, and her eyes got really big. And at that moment, I was like, okay, Holy Spirit, I just said, said to myself, Holy Spirit is here, here's your open door. And I began talking to her about how much the Lord loved her. And it was such a ministry to her. Did she receive Christ that day? I don't know. I, I don't even remember. But did, were seeds planted that day? Was the door open to the Lord going into her heart? I don't need to remember what the outcome of it is. I just, I just need to know I need to be faithful in those moments. One of the ways that the Lord has taken away my angst about situations like that, when I walk away from counseling someone immediately the enemy will begin to taunt. You didn't say this. You should have said this to her. You left out this phraseology. That wasn't exactly the Roman road. You didn't do it this way. And I have had to just rest on Paul's words that I read to you a few minutes ago, 
Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received it from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. And so I walk away, and I say this prayer, God, would you water those seeds that were planted? If I said anything offensive, would you cause her to forget it? If I said anything that needs to stick, would you, would you create good soil for them, God? And I walk away knowing that God, God has this. It's not about me. He has it. And that he'll continue to do that work in their life. And again, in 1 Corinthians 2.13, this is what we speak. This is Paul again. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. These are some of the things that I pray for when I share my faith with them. The first one is that I would have supernatural love for whoever comes in. We get people from all walks of life, and um, I just I want to be able to love them. So... You have heard this. This is 1 Corinthians 13. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't have love, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, secret his secret plans, wouldn't you like to know all that? And possess all knowledge. And if I had faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures every circumstances. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages will cease, but love will last forever. The second thing that I pray is, God, would you would you allow me to see that person through your eyes? I don't want to see them through my filters because I have stuff. I have, I have ways that I'm not loving in a full way. But if I can see that person through the Lord's eyes, then I'm going to be able to love them better. I want to see them as God sees them. He loves them way better than I do. Um, the third thing, and this is something that I read years ago, and I'll just paraphrase this story, I pray for a face that says yes. I don't want somebody to come to me and me have a scowl on my face or be stressed out about something. And I want them to feel completely comfortable, comfortable with me and open with me. So um, there was a story about um, Thomas Jefferson who was traveling with a group of companions across the country on horseback. And they came to a river where the, the river had completely exceeded its banks, was, the current was super fast, and the, um, the bridge had washed away. And so all of his companions, who were taking their lives in their own hands, were having to ford this river, go, a, go across on their horses, w- with all the current doing everything, and it was super difficult. And uh, Thomas Jefferson was still on his horse at the edge of the bank, and um, it was, there was a very real possibility of death during that time. And during that time, there was a traveler who was sort of, that was not with the group, but was sort of standing aside and watching all of this happen and stepped aside to watch. And after several of the men had made it across, had forded the river, made it to the other side, the, president at, the stranger asked President Jefferson if he would ferry him across the river. The president agreed without hesitation. So the man climbed on, and they struggled across the river, and they made it safely. 
And when he got to the other side, one of the other companions looked at him and said, why did you ask him to take you across the river? Did you just want the president to do it? And the stranger looked at him and he said, oh, I didn't know that was a president. I thought he was just traveling with you. I chose him because he had a face that said yes. All of your other faces said no. And um, so that is just something that stuck with me for years. And you know that Jesus obviously had a face that said yes from the way people followed him and wanted to hear from him. He had a face that said yes in the midst of all of the Pharisees and Sadducees and all of the people that had scowls on their faces that said no. Of course the people wanted to follow Jesus because his face said yes. So that's something that I continue to pray for. Um, the fourth thing, and I'm sure there's other things, but th that's important, is that I might be relevant to this particular age group. I'm in my 60s. They're in their 20s. There's a big difference in generations right there. And there's a big difference in my culture versus their culture. And I need to enter her culture not expect her to enter my culture. So I have to remember to use words that are not deep theological words or, you know, expensive, I, I call them ex expensive Christian words, sanctification and salvation and resurrection and repentance. I have, to, I have to go into what her culture is and use that verbiage where she's really going to understand what I'm talking about and not feel insecure or put off by me. Um, there was a young girl years ago that came into the center, beautiful girl, and she had a tattoo. I can't tell you what the tattoo said because if you ever saw her in public, that would be a breach of my confidentiality. So I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to say what the tattoo said. But let's say it was completely across her chest in these giant letters. It was like, wow, look at that. And um, let's say that the tattoo said something like crazy or weirdo. It was something really like out there that was in my, in my mind, wow, that's pretty condemning to have that tattoo written across her, her chest that way. And we talked for a minute and I, and I always ask people, why don't you tell me about your tattoo? And, you know, and you know, what, what prompted you to put that on your chest? I want to know. And she said, oh, that's just what I think about myself. And I think other people think that about me too. And I just looked at her. I paused and I looked at her and I said, well, you know what the Lord says about you? He calls you, and I used my sign language. I go, he calls you beautiful. And in that moment, she just, it was, it was a Holy Spirit moment. She paused and her eyes got really big, and I knew then, again, it's an open door. You can start talking to her about the love of the Lord. You can start talking to her about the way the Lord pursues her, even in the midst of her situation, that he doesn't condemn you, that maybe you're even in this situation so that you will be in, in a point where you're down on your knees and looking up at him like, God, I have no one else but you. And um, I just would use those moments. Again, the Holy Spirit is the one that opens open that door. I have other stories which are just amazing, but um, I, that's for another day. But anyway, the, this is something that gives me boldness, and you, you saw it initially when I asked my grandchildren to come up and pray for me. Um, knowing that others are praying for me gives me boldness in a situation. I know that I'm not alone when I go into that counseling room. I know, number one, that I am overshadowed by the Lord Almighty, that he has my back, that I don't need to, if somebody rejects me and says, I don't want to hear about this, I don't need to fear because God is on my side and he's given me in that moment superhero status. I don't need to, I don't need to worry about it. I'm protected by him. And I'm also surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I'm surrounded by people that I know are praying. I'm surrounded by my, my kids and my grandchildren. I'm not walking solo. I'm surrounded by women's Bible study, friends that are praying. 
I'm surrounded by people in my Zoom group that are praying. I'm surrounded by believers at the house of prayer that I know have been contending against the injustices of abortion for years now. And so I know the Lord is with me. I have that confidence of that. Um, I, some of you have this, but I also know that there are prayer texts that go out from First Coast Women's Services, little notes that say, please pray for this person that's considering an abortion. So there's, I don't know how many are on the prayer text, maybe 700 right now. So I know in that moment, there's 700 believers around Jacksonville and, and elsewhere that are also praying. So I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you in, for the way that you participate in the gospel, in sharing the gospel that way. When you're praying, when you're giving to a ministry, if you don't have to be up here, but you are participating in sharing the gospel when you're doing that. You are participating. In praying, you are chasing the enemy away. You are giving me and other people a covering. I want to open the altar for prayer. I um, haven't talked to Brian about this, but I don't think he'll mind. Um, I know the Holy Spirit is right now um, speaking to you. I know he's provoking you, prompting you. Um, I know that um, you might think, gosh, I've always wanted to do something like this. I've always either wanted to serve in this ministry or be able to share the gospel or witness to other people. I've, I've always wanted to teach Sunday school, but I don't know if I have what it takes. Or there's lots of ways. I've always wanted to reach out to my next door neighbor, but, but I don't know if they'll reject me or not. And so you might be feeling, you might just need, feel a need to pray for boldness in that situation. You can go ahead, Kayla, if you want to. Thank you. Um, you might need prayer to help you strengthen those, those muscles, those sharing your faith muscles. And you might also want to, this is a big one, ask the Lord, God, I've been thinking about this. Would you put somebody in my path that you want me to minister to? If you, would you make it really clear to me who I'm supposed to speak to today, who I'm supposed to share my faith with, who I'm supposed to love on, to encourage, to be a listening ear, whatever it takes. Just ask the Lord to do that. So I'm going to pray right now. God, I thank you. I thank you for Maranatha Church. I thank you for their heart for sharing the gospel. I thank you for Brian, for the leadership here, for Kevin and Kayla, and, and just the ways that they provoke us and push us and um, cause us to get out of our comfort zone and, um, and minister in this way. And Lord, I know there's a lot of others of us that really are feeling that, that, that burden, that unction for needing prayer. So God, we just, we just ask Holy Spirit that right now that you would come and minister to their hearts, that you would surprise them with words for sharing their faith, that you would give them boldness to open their mouths, God. Father, I, I just, I come against the enemy who, want, who wants to kill, steal, and destroy any of their thoughts that they're receiving from the Holy Spirit. We bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. And we say, he has no dominion over any thought life, over any being called forth. No dominion. He has no place in our minds. We break off the lies and we ask you, Holy Spirit, to come and minister your love and your grace and your mercy and your calling forth and you're um, provoking us to take that baton and pass it to the next person down. God, I thank you. I thank you over and over. I thank you that you consider us worthy to be your vessels. You consider us worthy. You put people in our places because you look down and you say, Jenny, I'm, I choose you to do this. Brian, I choose you. Martina, I choose you. Kayla, I choose you to be in that place. 
Yolanda, I choose you to be in that place. You're my worthy vessel. Jackie, you're my worthy vessel. I thank you that you call us in that way. In Jesus' name, amen.